Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are welcome once again. My name is Daniel Jima, and I'm here with a special guest uh, to have an exclusive interview. I'm actually here with the head of the department of the Imaging Technology and Sonography, um, Dr. Sam Uche. Now, the Department of Imaging Technology and Sonography has an association named the Association of Medical Imaging Students, UCC chapter, popularly known as Amy's UCC. As it is with every association, there is always a week in a year that is marked to celebrate the pioneers, as it were, or the very foundation of the association. In our case, we celebrate and honor the gentleman who made radiology, which is a field of medicine which deals with using radiation to take images of the internal body structures for diagnostic purposes possible. He is in the person of Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen. He discovered X-rays on the 8th of November 1895. Hence, during the week of 8th November every year, we commemorate and honor him. However, this year the re-celebration is pulled forward due to COVID, which has distorted the academic calendar. In view of this, Amy's UCC will have their celebration during the week of 25th to 27th August 2021, this week. As part of the program outline, we decided to have an exclusive interview with Dr. Samuel Che, who is our head of the department. Good evening, Doc. And Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, Daniel. Thank you. In order for you to be on the same page as I am, I would like to give you a little bit about my tell you a little bit about my my, my guest. So Dr. Samuel Che holds a Doctor of Optometry degree uh, from the University of Cape Coast. He also holds an MPhil in Pharmacology from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. He then proceeded to have a PhD from the University of KwaZulu Natal, Geneva, South Africa. He was appointed a principal research assistant with the Department of Optometry on September 30th, 2010. He was appointed a senior member on October 11th, 2011. He served as a member of the governing board of the Allied Health Professions Council from 2018 to 2020. Dr. Samoche is currently the head of the Department of Imaging Technology and Sonography of the University of Cape Coast. He also works with the Department of Optometry. He was born and raised in NCIM No. 2 in the Wasa Aminfi district, but lived most of his life in Asante Achim Gaso. He had his elementary school at the Gaso LHJSS. He proceeded to have his secondary education at Konongo Jumase Senior Secondary School from 1999 to 2001. He started an optometry program in Zimbabwe and volunteered to teach for free in Cameroon in a newly established optometry department. He worked as an external examiner in Uganda and Malawi. He is a rigorous academic. He has interests in research, academic writing, and training of other allied health professionals. He partnered with Rastet Lean in the United States of America from the University of Alabama of Birmingham and was given a Roche Research Fellow Award from the Association of Research, Vision and Ophthalmology in 2018 with a topic Objectively Measured Adherence to Hypertensive Medications in Patients with Glaucoma in Ghana. He has co-authored 98, sorry, he has 98 co-authored peer-reviewed articles to his credit. He has co supervised some PhD theses and is currently supervising an MFA and PhD thesis. So that's a little bit about my guest. Uh, so now you are at the same level. You are welcome once again, Doc. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to having a very good conversation with you. All right, so this is the most interesting part. I know you are waiting for this one. It's a question time. So let's delve right in. So the first question, please, who is Dr. Samuti? Okay. Doctor so Samuel say if I am put it very let me say jovially, Doctor Samuel say the one sitting before you. <laughs> um, but if I have to use words to describe myself, I would say that um I am an optometrist by profession. Um and currently with the department of optometry, but I've been seconded to the Department of Imaging Technology and Sonography to lead the department around this time of the academic year. So um, basically what I do includes 
to do my primary duties at the Department of Optometry and perform administrative duties at the Department of Imaging Technology and Sonography. Thank you. Okay, all right. So thank you very much for, for that response. We will get into your duties as a um, uh, doubling as the as the head of the, the head of department for imaging technology and sonography, and at the same time work with the department of optometry. We will delve into that that in a bit. But then let let me ask this one: uh, There is always a backbone to great men like you. Without the support from your family, your achievement could not be possible. May you kindly tell us about your cherished family? Oh, okay. I have a wife. If I have multiple ones, I will mention them. But for now, I have one. I have a wife and three children. Oh, okay. I have a boy as my first son okay. and two other girls following. Okay. I think it was a prayer God answered for me. <laughs> it was my wish that I have a boy as my first son oh, or my first child. <laughs> so by the grace of God, I have a boy as my first child and then the two other girls also follows. Uh, my wife is very, I would say, understanding. And I would say she seems to understand the kind of trouble that I've brought upon myself. <laughs> that is the work we come and we don't go home. We have time, we are in a rush to leave early morning to work. But when you are going home, you are very, very hesitant because there are a lot of things still on your desk you haven't completed. And then probably she will call in the evening to ask, what food should we leave for you? Are you going to eat today, even after all? Because looking at the time, probably you'll be coming home. It's like that. So they have been very supportive. Um, but in case, they'll be there sometimes during weekends, I want to leave home. They'll say, Daddy, today you are not going anywhere. <laughs> the boy, for instance, will come and stand by the door and block the gate. That he's not allowing you to go anywhere. Uh, they have been very understanding and supportive. That certain time today, Daddy will go to the office with you. And you know what they want to come to my office to come and do? They also want to get access to the internet where they can play games. And <laughs> for that reason, they prefer to come to my school rather than going to their school. They have uh, agenda. So that is it. So that is, that is a bit about my family. Probably, yes, we understand that. We understand that. That's very interesting. Uh, please, let's talk about your, your religious life a bit. Uh, we also know you to be a reverend minister or a pastor. In fact, me, for example, it surprised me. Please tell us, what is the actual title? Is it a reverend minister or a pastor? How many years have you done this and in which denomination? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Probably because I'm on camera, that is why I needed to set the record straight to say that um, I have only one wife okay. <laughs> for now. That's what I said. In fact, the truth is that I'm an ordained minister of the Assemblies of God Church, Assemblies of God Ghana. Um, in 2017, thereabout, I graduated from the Bible school at the Southern Ghana uh, Bible College. That is the seminary for Assemblies of God. That is located in Southampton. It was just after I completed my PhD that I gave myself to that particular responsibility as well. Um, and since that time, I've been the associate pastor at Assemblies of God Campus Church and the patron to Assemblies of God Campus Ministry, AGCM. Um, though I am an ordained minister, there are three other people, or two other people, sorry, two other people who are also in there at the church. Okay. So two of us are associated to the senior pastor, who is uh, Reverend Aboli. So, we do our pastoral responsibilities together with the other things that we need to do. Okay. So that is it. All right. All right. <laughs> Interesting one there. Yeah. Now, let me find out this one. Uh, how are you able to combine your responsibilities as a reverend minister, head of, depart of the department, and as a lecturer with the Department of Complementary? All these three duties, how are you able to combine them? No, I think you have even narrowed down the duties. Because the duties are, for me, they are even more than what you have identified. Really? One, I'm a full-time husband. Oh, yes. Yes, you understand? Oh, yes. Full-time family man. All of the words that I'm mentioning, they are all full-time. Full-time uh, lecturer. All those kind of things we want yeah, to talk about. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is that I think what I do is to 
try as much as possible not to waste time. I believe that time is a very precious resource that each and every one of us will have to cherish. So what I do is that I try as much as possible to use my time very judiciously. My life is more or less cut out. And each time I know what I have to do at any point in time so that I don't also get too much engaged with so many things at a time. Even though I do have multiple roles to play, there are some of them that are routine, there are some of them that comes occasionally. But if you check for the work of being a pastor, the work of being a lecturer and other things, those ones tend to be a routine. So what I try to do is that I take the day, I take each day by, I take the whole issue day by day. So once the day comes, I look at what I'm supposed to do, plan it, and then carry on with whatever I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So what I try to do is that I don't waste so much time. What I mean by waste so much time is that um, there are certain times that you see people gather at some places. It's not like we don't have leisure. When we need to break off and have some fun, we do. Mm -hmm. But we try as much as we to make sure we maximize the day. We maximize the day. And that is it. It, it actually sometimes even uh, leads to having to work a bit of a, like do some extension, like do extended time when it comes to some of these issues. But uh, that notwithstanding, I think that we are managing the time, the 24 hours that is given to everybody <laughs> in a day. Is that which I'm trying to use for all that? Okay. Huh? I wish I wish that 24 hours would be extended for you and me too, that we can have more time to yourself. Uh, it's not possible. So we have to manage the 24 hours. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, I know you, you picked a clue from, from what you just said about time management. Even though we will get to a section where you, you will advise us, but then uh, I'm starting to gain some point from it. I know you are still you're also gaining some point from it. Uh, no, please, let's zoom in on your academic life a bit. Um, how smooth or difficult has your progression on the academic ladder been? Please walk us through from your elementary school to where you are going to that. Okay. Um, I started my elementary school from where I lived. That is Jaso. Asante Achim. In fact, what actually happened was that if you look at my primary background, my parents managed to send me to, they would say those days, they would say an international school of a sort. But at a point in time, they were struggling to pay fees. Okay. So I have to leave from that end to another place, which popularly we would call it a Saito. <laughs> so I went to Jaso LA. That time, you say LA means local authority, or so LA 1. You know, we had we used to have LA one, LA two, and then LA three. Okay. The LA one and the LA two were primary schools, okay. and the LA three was the JHS. Okay. So we used to run that uh, shift system. So the LA one people are those who may come in the morning. The two people will come in the afternoon. We we'll do that for two weeks and we we'll, we we'll switch. Oh, okay. The other people will also come in the morning. The others will also come in the afternoon. So from there, I proceeded to uh, the, I, I went to JHS there. When I completed, I managed to get admission at Konohu Dumasi Senior High School. That wasn't that of a difficulty, because if if I tell you from where I'm coming from, uh, not too many people even qualify or passes their BC to move from there to other places. Uh, so I managed to get to Konohu Dumasi Senior High School, which is just a stone throw from Gaso. It's just about 10 kilometers away. Konohu is just about 10 kilometers away from Gaso. So there too, we have to do our secondary education. It was at the time that they said they have rest restricted the academic year to two and a half years. That was around that time. So I completed Konohu in the year 19, 2001. 2001, that was when. I went there in 1999 and completed in 2001. The ones we completed um, proceeded to the University of Cape Coast where I got the opportunity to come and read the Doctor of Optometry program. At the time, it was a newly introduced program. We happened to be the second batch. Okay. The first batch were made up of five people. And we, the second batch, we were made up of 17. Out of the 17, 16 of us were able to make it. Okay. One of us fell along the way. Not like the person died, but the person That's couldn't complete. complete. Yeah, that is what I want to mean, but he fell by the wayside. So we completed. And immediately I completed the university 
listed or submitted a list of people that they wanted to them to do their service with the department at the time it wasn't like we have it now it was more like once you are selected to come and serve in the department the likelihood that your service will be needed is fine it's very it's very much assured because it was like they were trying to groom people to fill in the department so once that opportunity came i had that kind of thinking that maybe one day i may end up also becoming a teacher like my mother so I did happen that after that I did my service here. That is my intention. During the internship, I was both affiliated to the department and also to the Christian Eye Center okay. in Cape Coast, okay. where I was supposed to have a clinical experience and also to be assisting with activity, yeah. activities at the department. Okay. So immediately after that, in fact, I was on my way out actually. So what I did was that I actually decided to, uh, while doing the service, gather money. I tried to put money together through my service because we were doing some local here and there as well. So we were able to gather enough money and I purchased the form for the pharmacology program at Kia University. Because at the time, and even as it is, there wasn't so many opportunities for optometrists within the country. Okay. That is for further training. You have to travel outside and you have to get a scholarship. And whilst we were waiting for scholarship and scholarship weren't available or weren't in at the time, we felt like, why can't we make use of what we have? I identified one area where we had a lack, that is, was in pharmacology. Okay. I felt like if we get somebody who, are, who is into I and is applying the concept of pharmacology in that same field, that person may end up being a better teacher, okay. giving the right illustrations okay. than probably the person who don't have any link with the area and have come in to come and do an academic work. Oh, okay. So I decided to go into pharmacology. So when I finished my service, because at the time I was having my service, I had bought the form. Okay. I was waiting for, because normally we finish the service around July, July yeah. and then August is our leave. Yeah. So normally admissions also comes around August. Okay. So I was called for interview by the grace of God. Okay. I, I was considered. I was given admission to go to Kia University. And then there I did two years of pharmacology. By the grace of God, that one too, I was able to complete on record time. Okay. So uh, the program was supposed to be for two years. And by the second year, I had finished. Oh, okay. So once I finished my work, I did finish the work that same year and defended the same year. So I got oh, okay. my certificate within <laughs> that second year, okay. that second within that same period. Okay. Uh, most of it are the people who finish and then the defense will get into the what? Into the third the year third or something. Year. But this time around, almost everything happened within that Sweet. period. So from there, um, I proceeded to University of Pajulu Natal, mm -hmm. where I did my PhD from 2013. So when I completed in 2012, in 2013, I continued to, um, what is it called? Pajulu Natal. I must say that, I have been privileged, even though it has been a bit stressful. I've had continuous tertiary education till I got my PhD. So from 2003 to 2009, where I got my BSc and my OD, after that, my internship between 2009 to middle, mid of 2010. Then from there, I proceeded to Kia USD from there to go and do, and then from there, I went to South Africa. So I think I've had all together seven, that is six plus one internship, that makes seven, then plus, a, two. plus two, making nine, nine then plus, plus three, three, making what? Twelve. twelve. So it was twelve Continuous. straight okay. years. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Please, uh, let, me, let me find out this. Uh, uh, you, you have your PhD in, in which field? In optometry. Optometry. Okay. The PhD was in optometry there. Um, Masters was in pharmacology, okay. but the PhD I came back to optometry. The idea was that I thought that the, uh, the, the knowledge in pharmacology was going to be very helpful in applying, in application okay. of optometry. So that is what I tried to do. So okay. when I went out, I came back to, to do the optometry or to finish up with optometry. All right. All right. Thank you very much. That, that was very interesting.
Right. We we know you to be a senior lecturer in the University of Cape Coast, but we also know you to hold a doctor of optometry degree. Um, during our conversation, uh, you mentioned something about uh, having to do your internship and having some clinical experience with the Christian Eye Center. Yeah. But please, how many years have you been able? Have you been practicing optometry? Uh, and how many years have you been lecturing? Oh, okay. Um, in optometry um, training, it is sometimes very difficult for you to decouple practice from the teaching. From the teaching, okay. Uh, as part of the requirement, every optometry school is expected to have what we call an on-site clinic. Okay. Okay, where you will be using for the in-house training of your trainees. So for all this while, I have been practicing optometry okay. alongside with my work, my teaching. Okay. Just as it happens in the medical school, those who are still medics and are in the academia still have opportunity to stay to be practicing their profession wherever they find themselves. So we have also had that opportunity to be here whilst teaching, we are practicing and using some of the experiences that we have acquired to train students in terms of clinical experience. So that is one of the things that we've been able to oh, okay. do. Okay. So I would say that um, though there have been times that we've been in school and all that, during all that time that we've been in school, we have been attached to various facilities, facilities. to be uh, upgrading our clinical skills okay. and to make sure that we stay in continuous practice. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you for that one. Uh, kindly educate us, Doc. We hear of such terms as optometrists, ophthalmologist, optician. Uh, please, what are these? Or what is the difference between all these all these terms? And which one of them do you belong? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for that question. In fact, actually, what happens is that we have the eye care team, okay. and most often than not, the eye care team comprises of ophthalmologist, followed by the optometrist and then the optician. Okay. Now, what happens is that the ophthalmologist is a medical doctor who has gone ahead to specialize in what? In eye. So, oh, okay. ophthalmology is a medical specialty. Okay. Then, the optometrist or optometry is a primary health care, okay, who specializes in eye and vision care. So, it's a primary health care practitioner who specializes in eye and vision care. So, he isn't a medic. He takes up his profession or his, his course of uh, his line of um, um, duty, more or less, as it were. He takes up the, line, the, the eye care training right from the start. Okay. All like the ophthalmologist who have to go to the medical school. Oh, okay. And after the medical school, he goes into a specialty area of ophthalmology. For the opticians, the opticians are um, people who work with the eye care team but mainly what they normally do is that they normally take care of the technical aspect of eye care. You know, in eye care, what happens is that when you come in, after you have been seen, they will have to be dispensed with lenses and all that. So they will have to do the fitting, choosing of a frame or assisting the oh, patient okay. or the individual to choose the frame and all that. And then they will fit the lens for the individual and advise them on how to care for their lenses appropriately. So that is how it is. So we are all group of people who feed from this small organ. Okay. So we have to feed from this small organ. <laughs> so what we do to the eye, we get something small okay. to also what? To feed ourselves <laughs> and our family. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Doc, does that mean the ophthalmologist is the high, being an ophthalmologist is the highest level one can reach the line of optometry? What happens is that uh, they are, they are, Two independent track. Okay. Okay. It is like if I'm to use it, radiologist okay. and a radiographer. Okay. okay. The radiographer isn't a radiologist. Okay. But the two of them work together within the same, same department. Yeah. So their line or their 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 line of activity sometimes do cross, okay. but their training do have some kind of overlaps of the like. But they are at a different level. Okay. So it is this that that would be the best way to probably explain it's to you for you to understand the sonographer and probably the radiologist. The radiologist is a medical specialist or yeah. is a medical specialty, but that of the radiography and what they are more or less like um 
other people who also work within that domain okay they work within that domain but they are not and so it, it, it can't be that a radiographer will grow and become a radiologist, a radiologist unless you take the path of uh, being a radiologist exactly. okay. Okay. in other jurisdictions elsewhere in china and in some other places in asia the optometry and ophthalmology program are a bit combined okay they have optometry and ophthalmology. but when because we are running typically of the british we are running the british system their line is different, different. our line is different, different. Okay. but okay. we all work on the eye okay, okay? Right. normally what happens is that if i'm even to make it even simpler the ophthalmologist Will, will be able to work on optical, medical, and surgical management of eye diseases. Okay. The optometrists work on optical and medical management. Okay. Then the, the opticians will work on the optical aspect oh, okay. of eye care. Okay. So if you like, look at it, then you realize that the ophthalmologist has a broader scope, yeah. like a yeah. third layer yeah. Yeah. of the yeah. surgery. surgery. Uh -huh. If you go elsewhere, for instance, for no invasive surgeries like in the US and other things, optometrists are allowed to do those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But it all has to do with the law that governs the practice within any jurisdiction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I'm so much educated. I know that you have also been education. So the next time you hear such words, then don't be confused. There are clear differences between those ones. All right. Uh, Doc, your profile spoke about you pursuing your PhD in the University of. South yeah, Africa. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us how was life like in South Africa? Ah, uh, you may not be able to <laughs> compare home <laughs> okay. to any other place. Yes. So I would say that it was like life outside home. Just as most of you have left your parents and you are here and you are now trying to also begin something, mm -hmm. trying to project into your future of a sort. So I would say that, you know, in South Africa at the time, they would tell you that the crime rate in South Africa was very high at the time. So when you even get in there as a foreigner, you need to be very careful and the like. But you know, you were focused, you went there for a particular reason, and you focus on what you want. And by the grace of God, we were protected mm -hmm. from all kinds of issues. Most of it, I know, most of the data collections too was done in Ghana. Oh, okay. So at the end of the day, I spent greater part of that time also still with my family okay. here, uh -huh. instead of staying there throughout my duration of what study. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Thank you very much for that. Dublin as the as a lecturer in the Department of Optometry and the head of the Department for Imaging Technology and Sonography, you must be making some sacrifices. Kindly share with us some of your memorable challenges and achievements. Challenges. <laughs> it has been challenging as life itself. <laughs> okay. Um, there are certain times that a lot of things begin to clash. Okay. You are called to duty at the same time by these two different Department. departments. <laughs> I remember one time my head of department, you know that place to have a head of department. Okay. Head of department. I have not been seeing you. Do you know that this is your department? <laughs> and I also have to make sure that I don't make that department also feel like you are orphan. Okay. <laughs> because I also have a responsibility towards that particular department. Yeah. So yeah. I have to make sure that I also execute my fine. So for the sacrifice we have to do is to prioritize the things we have to do. Okay. Uh, there are certain times that probably it may happen that there are things happening in my department. But in order of preference, if what I need to do here will have to take preeminence over what has to happen at my department, then since I'm not omnipresent and I can't be everywhere at the same time, I may have to choose one of the places I'll have to be at any point in time. Um, so that has been some of the things I have to do. So it comes with, let's say, opportunity cost. There's a attendant cost for whatever thing that apparently I decide to do. But it has been very interesting trying to do that. So where I have the opportunity to really schedule, I try to schedule my activity such that it doesn't conflict with that of my primary department. That notwithstanding, there are some of them that are unavoidable. Okay. There are some of them that probably they may have to happen at the same time. In that case, I just use, choose them on a the scale of preference and I decide which one I have to okay. attend okay. and which ones I can, that can wait. Okay. Uh -huh. There was another second part of it you said. You said the, for the achievement. The achievement. Yeah. Uh, for the achievement, what would I even say? 
But now, when I came into the department, for instance, I observed some few talents. Okay. And um, I must say that if we haven't been able to clear all of them, we are trying to. One of the things that I felt immediately that needed to be done was to clean up the uh, transcript. Transcripts. Let me put it that way. That is to clean up the transcript of the students. And then also there was another other issue is to also make sure that we beef up the staff. You know, it was a department that was heavily, de was heavily dependent on uh, part-timers. Part yeah. I can say that for now, to a very large extent, except where it is so critical, we have managed to reduce our dependence on the part on part-timers. Mm -hmm. Actually, what, I, what, I, what, that, what that was creating was that uh, it was putting students rather at the mercy of their tutors. Yeah. For you know, the part-timers do have their primary responsibility. Yeah. There are certain times that natural occurrences may, may, may not make it, may, may make it difficult for them to come and honor whatever they have to do. Yeah. Some of them have to block their lecture. And what happens that a student will have to come in and do like three hours, four hours, mm -hmm. six hours lecture, continuous and all that, so that they will be able to cover up what it's supposed to be. So we've been able to bring down that to a large extent. For now, um, the areas that we had a lot of challenge was sonography and sonography because we are not having too many people with PhDs for the university we say that for you to get uh, appointed they are, you have to have a terminal degree uh, one other thing too is that most of the staff here are now on their those who do not have their terminal degrees I'm not very sure of any of them except for the one who was just if I joined the department not less no more than three months ago all of them are now on their PhD programs Okay, on part-time basis, so that they can be helping at the department whilst doing their PhDs. So hopefully, in the next few years to come, we hope that we will get a lot of people with terminal degrees. We managed to also attract one such um, person from University of um, Norway. Okay. We caught somebody from Norway. In fact, the person has actually been appointed, accepted the appointment but indicate that for her to be able to join the department fully, she has to part ways with her university there, oh, and that okay. will take her about six months. Wow. So <laughs> apparently she may be joining from oh, next, next academic year. year. Oh, okay. So that is so far what we've been able to do. Okay. So I think that basically we are on course. We are running the department uh, with the little resources that we do yeah. have. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I think this is good news for everyone. Is that right? <laughs> yes, I think so. All right. Now, you told me during my earlier conversation with you that uh, you served as a board member uh, of the governing council of the Allied Health Professions Council from 2018 to 2020. Good. Please tell us, what were your role as a, as a board member and uh, what challenges came along with it and then how were you able to overcome your challenges? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Allied Health Professions Council. As a board member, we are supposed to uh, give policy direction okay. to the council so that the operations of the council will be based on some of these policy directions that we have, what we have given. At Allah Health Professor Council, I served as the chair for the Education Subcommittee. The Education Subcommittee is the one or the committee that is responsible for the writing of the licensure exams. Okay. You know, at every point in time when fresh graduates are churned out from the university or are produced from the university, what apparently happens is that they have to go through a mandatory internship period. And once that internship period is over, they have to sit for a licensure exam, which is going to uh, grant them that leverage, that legal backing for them to practice their profession, their what they have studied from the various investors. Yeah. So I have to chair that particular committee Mainly, that's what we were supposed to do. We were also in charge of uh, that committee, was also directly responsible or communicate directly with the training institutions to see which programs are accredited okay. and uh, which programs are not accredited. And then we were supposed to publish accredited programs and institutions and those that were not accredited. And in other words, one of the other things to, to check for students who are entering into the program, that is what we call the indexing. Okay. Now, by the grace of God, Finally, that policy has been rolled out. So that we have indexing. Once you are coming into the school, you will be indexed 
That is the Allah Health Professor in Council will give you more or less like a unique number. Okay. That you will use you use to run throughout your program. Okay. And then the departments or the various institutions will keep they will keep track on you. So that when you some people like for instance I said we were sixteen, we were seventeen at the time and one drop. They know who is dropping out and who is whatever. Okay. So that we don't get people coming in from other places to come in like oh, okay. infiltrates into okay. their professions okay. because the likelihood that by the time people are leaving a school will then go and bring people from so many some from okay. Copy, okay. some from that other place and say that these are the professionals we have mm. trained and so we are presenting them for exam but this time around we are tracking you from the beginning okay. to the end and i also was a member of the professional practice committee okay. so the professional practice committee who were responsible for the practitioners for cpds okay. and all those kind of things okay. So we look at it, we design CPD policies and guidelines. In fact, during the COVID, we have to now develop an ad hoc, more or less, policy with regards to online CPD. Okay. For most of them, that we were not used to this online okay. thing. It was more like webinars and all those things. We were not used to them. We used to have physical meetings. But now, because of that, we needed to look at it and look at the modalities that will govern those things. Um, the challenges are being to deal with a large group of professions. All I heard is like, uh, uh, is like I don't know, unlike other, other councils, we are a whole, like, I, would, I don't know how to even put it. We are a bit heterogeneous. Uh, yes, an and, array of professions coming and, together. And, so. and we are many. And one interesting thing is that each day that is called today, new professions <laughs> are being birthed. Yeah. And when they give birth to new professions, they will tell you, Go to Allah Health. <laughs> so why do they want? Because they want their profession to be regulated. They want everything to be done as professionals. Okay. They will go to the ministry. And the ministry says, go to Allah Health. So in as much as we had many children to manage, we kept on having more children. It looks like we can't have family planning for ourselves. Yeah. So yeah. we family planning wasn't good for us. So or it was not working for us. Okay. So even though we have many children, we kept on giving birth to what to many other more. Yeah. Okay, many people wanting to come. And the issue has been with if you have that kind of environment where you have plenty of children coming from different backgrounds, uh, sometimes the I would say that the platform, okay, the very thing that connects us sometimes is very loose. And these people come with their issue, this group come with their issue, their issues are different, some of the issues are very different from others. Some of the professors are trained at degree level, others are diploma, others are certificate, mm -hmm. others are even PhD and master's level, and all of them are in a particular group. Mm -hmm. So when you go there, when the PhD people are talking, <laughs> and then, then those of us who are doing certificate, we are also talking. <laughs> oh, everybody has his own need, yeah. but you know, then it becomes like, you keep quiet. <laughs> Let those of us here, let's talk. We are talking philosophy, you are here, you are talking certificate. <laughs> so those are some of the issues that we have had to deal with indeed. Yeah. But it has been very interesting doing all these kind of things. For achievements, I would say that we were able to achieve quite a number of things. One of the things that we realized or we, we were able to do was to resolve professional conflict. Okay. The professional conflict has to do with some of the professions. You know, in Ghana, they have what we call the Professional Bodies Registration Act. Okay. Okay, we have professional bodies and we have several associations. So, for instance, we get there, we have nutritionists. They have their group, and then there's another group that will have other nutritionists in them. And so when you want to deal with nutritionists, you don't know which group to go to. <laughs> so what we needed to do was to resolve those conflicts. Then you'll be there. Some people will come in and tell you that we are biomedical scientists. Others say we are laboratory scientists. Right. Others will say we are uh, 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 laboratory whatever. They mention so many names. So you have to make sure that we dealt with all those kind of issues to make sure that there's much there's a much more smoother ground for us to work, for us to operate. And that is actually one of the biggest things we were able to do. Mm -hmm. We were able to revise the CPD guidelines for the council. Um, successful rights, uh, licensure exams, and all that. Um, again, we were able to also push for uh, more or less ally. Okay. ally. We haven't okay. been able to complete it, but we were able to take it to another notch where we're trying to make sure that almost all the professions are defined very ca carefully, and then the ally will give a kind of, let me say, backing okay. to the world, to the law. Now, the Ally Health Professional Council is even being expanded. Now, we have 
uh, the, the registrar and he has two deputy assistants now. Mm -hmm. We're able to develop a scheme of work for the council and all that. Wow. So wow. quite a few noble and uh, let me say humble achievements achievement. yeah. were made yeah. during that particular period. But there are still more to be done, I say. There are still, one of the things that we were also able to do was to be able to get all the people who matter to be registered. Okay. So we went sensitizing our people. There are people who have been working in Kolebu for 10 years, 20 years. They, have no, they don't know that they have to even be registered. Okay. When the crack, the, the people was cracked, there was some few times that they came on the news that they have gone to arrest quack people right, and yeah, whatever. Yeah. And we realized that there were some people too who were in teaching in our universities and they were not licensed. We felt like it wasn't a good example. So those people should be encouraged to come, to come and do that particular kind okay. of harness. So that was what happened. Wow. In the space of two years, even yeah. though the time looks, looks... Yeah, our, makes, time, uh, our yeah. time was a bit short, Yeah, but we managed to do, to do what yes, we have to yes, do. Yes. Yeah. And that's impressive. Yeah. Please, uh, now let's zoom in on your knowledge on medical imaging. You know you are coming from a yeah. completely different environment yeah. in today's department. Uh, my first question is, please tell us in brief your knowledge of medical imaging and your vision for the department. Oh, okay. Uh, for medical imaging, I know that they are also within the healthcare fraternity. Okay. More or less, because I, as I've indicated, because I work with Allied Health Professions Council, um, they consist of a myriad of cadres. Um, we have the sonographers, we have the radiographers. In, fa in some jurisdictions, even though in Allied Health we have registers for them, we have the medical physicists. Those yeah, are the people yeah. I talk to you that they train at the masters and the PhD level. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. There are not many, they are there. They, are also there. they have the therapists, they are also there, those people who go into uh, radiotherapy. Yeah. Radio yeah. 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 They are there, they have the nuclear physicists. Okay. Some of them are also there. They are also at the oncology unit and all those places. So what actually happens is that I know that they are very important when it comes to diagnosis in terms of healthcare. Just as the laboratory people are also important, they will take your blood, That's take okay. your uh, whatever fluids yeah. and all manner of things and tissues and other things. Your area is also very important where people will use radiation and other will use sound to be able to assess the people. So to be able to evaluate and diagnose diseases. But one of the interesting things about what I intend for this particular profession is to make sure that the profession become formidable. Okay. We get the right caliber of people who have interest in the profession. Okay. I've been to places where people are disinterested in their own profession. Okay. Because it was like I was looking for something to do. And after I look around, I did not find any. So they said that this one too is there. Because he says that if we go here, to also work in the hospital. Okay. So they came in, not knowing what they are even about. So when they come in, they are not able to own the profession. They are not able to advise the course of the profession. One of the things we intend to do is to make sure that we give the people the right kind of training. Because that is what I can do immediately. And to get the right caliber of people to what? To give them that kind of training. And give them the right or the ample clinical exposure time okay. to improve upon their clinical competence. After all, after all the academic work is over, they are expected to go out there and practice their profession and practice in a manner that is ethical and less or not non-injurious to the population because the patient safety also what matters. So that is one of the things we want to do. Okay. Um, I believe that uh, the department do have prospects and we need to leverage on that prospect and then make sure that we, we are able to expand the department. That is, I believe that in as much as probably we intend to train, because we do not have too many of the diagnosis centers, if the department manages to get a diagnosis center of a sort or convinces the investor to be able to invest into such a thing, not only would we be able to get avenues, to train our students, yeah. but we yeah. also be able to get some kind of let me say revenue, revenue yeah. to help grow the department. Mm -hmm. I understand that the equipment we use here are very expensive. Very expensive yeah. You go in there, you want to buy this thing for training, and it become an issue. One other thing that we were trying to do, or we've been trying to do, is to also get enough space, adequate space, because if you check at first, the department actually do not have a physical presence on the campus. Yeah because we are the diagnosis center. Yeah. But I think that for now, even though it is not a good or <laughs> an, a, a, it's not a, a, the ideal 
Okay, but at least we, we have we have a place that we can even hold an interview like this. Yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily that at first we couldn't have a place to have an interview, but the point is now we have a place that we can call our own. Uh -huh. So we're just praying that uh, things will go well and that we'll be able to even expand beyond this particular limit. Wow. That, that is it. Wow. You, you spoke about prospect of medical imaging. Let me, let me zoom in on that a little. Uh, how do you see the future of, of medical imaging? I see that, or I would say that in general, it is bright. The only issue that I want to just indicate here is that because we have a lack, there's a gap over the years, there wasn't, let me say, an aggressive trading yeah. of medical imaging aspects. For now, the awareness to train has come. So it looks like too many people are now coming on board. Yeah. Some of them are ill equipped. Yeah. And it's something that probably we need to check. So that those who are up there, those who have the without to be able to train, should be given a mandate too. Number one. Number two, my thinking is that we also have to look at numbers. The reason I'm talking about numbers is that, you know, because it's equipment intensive. If we tend to get too many people, the issue will be then that the quality of clinical exposure will go, is going to be a bit yeah. compromised. Yeah. Yeah. So it is proper that we look at how well the equipment or the available logistics or the number of students the available logistics can support. Okay, so that we do it that way. Because now it looks like we have, if I'm not there's about four or five public universities yes. running yes. Yes. medical yes. imaging program. Now, the other issue too has to do with the heterogeneity in the nature of the programs. When you go to um, Legon, Legon have radiography and then they have therapy. sonography at the postgraduate level. Oh, okay. And then they have therapy too yeah. at the undergraduate yeah. level. Yeah. And for the therapy, they say they do every other year or as and when needed, more or less, okay. let me put it okay. that way. When it comes to UCC, we have the radiography, not the sonography. When you go to KN University, they also have another yeah. kind of model. When you move up there to the north, that is UDS. UDS too have a kind of, let me say, a mixture of it. Of like, it looks like they have a bit of medical, uh, oh, okay. uh, the medical faces, a bit of radiography, a bit, a bit of sonography, a bit okay. more or less like a general yeah. form of yeah. training. Of yeah. sort. My thinking is that that should also be something that we need to really look at, address, so that we can have the same grounds for us to. It is one of the things that we're near to our prospects, okay, in the near future, to, 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 to really define what we are going to be and who we are going to be. Uh -huh. I have had a view that if it is possible, at the base, we can go general, and as we move up, we right, specialize. specialize. That has been my personal yeah. view. But you know, it is a profession that belongs to people. Yeah. And the experts are those who need to tell us and advise us what yeah. we ought to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, being the head of department in a field you have no to very limited expertise, how difficult is your task? And how are you able to lead people who have more knowledge in the field than you do? Yeah, you are very right. Uh, you don't need, as, as a leader, you don't need to be doing everything. We need to be coordinating, advising, and also receiving advice. Okay. In as much as you advise people, you also wait for people to advise you. And I believe that once you're able to establish a good working relationship with people, you don't need to know it. You only need to motivate the people who know to do, so that when the success come, you become a part of that success. Okay. So that is the approach that we have adopted in the department. Um, we do, not, we do not necessarily need to be part of the system okay. to do that particular thing. But once there is a well, there's always That's a way. Yeah. So yeah. that is why we want to get, we have, that is how come we have been able to get to where we are today. And I want to also take this opportunity to also um, thank okay. and express my gratitude to the staff of the department for they have been very supportive. Um, it is a, it's a kind of, let me say, um, all hands on deck, kind of. Okay. This person will have to take A, this person will have to take B. Where I need to go and push for administrative things to happen, I do go and push. 
where I need to make sure that every course is being taught and is being monitored adequately, we do. Where we realize students who have challenges that need to be addressed, we do. There are officers who are in charge of most of these particular things. When it comes to clinical activities and coordination, I will have to make sure that there's somebody who is there to do. When students have to be supervised when they are on their long vacation or their clinical placement or something, all those things are done. And I don't do that all by myself. I do together with the team. So it has been a team play, um, cooperation, hand going and hand coming as it were. <laughs> That is how I okay, say it. Okay. So delegation is the key. You don't mm. do everything all by yeah. yourself. Yeah. Please now let's zoom in on the, your perception on student leadership. Uh, you have been with the second student administration of the Association of Medical Imaging Students from the beginning till now. Uh, what are your general impressions so far, both rights and wrongs, and how you think the succeeding student administration can improve on everything? So far, so good. Um. This is not the only place I've been a student. Uh, let maybe I've, I've watched students do what they do. Uh, one of the things that I've realized is that the current leadership haven't done bad. They have done well. But when it comes to student leadership, one of the things that because we champion that our welfare of our colleagues or our colleague students, what happens is Sometimes the champion of the welfare it appears to be out of context. Okay. In every or to every right is a responsibility. Mm -hmm. So that when they come in, oh, I've not been able to pay my fees, so I've not been able to register, so do this thing for me. Once you have not been able to pay your fee, what it means then is that you are not even a part of a department yeah. in the first place, yeah. let alone to be part of an investor. <laughs> but they will come in and they think that everything should come to a standstill for them because it is about them. <laughs> and I have found that one to be very challenging. Okay. And you know, when the student leadership comes, you have to push through the things and push through and push through the things. Um, one of the other things that I've seen is that sometimes some of the leaders have not really gotten the necessary support that they needed. The reason for saying that is that each association has operations, they have plans and they have their own activities they want to embark on. Yeah. Most of these activities like we are even having, you need somebody's phone. Yeah. You may need to buy data. Yeah. You may need to get this court. Yeah. And all that thing that we are using now. But the colleagues or students don't want to pay anything like dues of a sort to support the association's activity. All they want is item 13, then we come for meeting. <laughs> Wherever that item 13 will come from, that is not your problem. <laughs> the issue is that once we are president, we need to go and get yeah. a galancy fit or something. <laughs> I don't know whether it's a mining zone and then get a thing for them. So for me, I'm thinking that once all the students are ready to support, things will really work right. And 95% of the times, I've also realized that students have not really thought of what can we also do to support the support department. The department. Is there something that we can buy to support the training of our own uh, program or our own little ones? Because probably you will be hesitant. Because in other departments, I've seen people, for instance, where I'm coming from, I've seen people who were students who bought some kind of, let me say, devices okay. for the department to enhance or to support okay. the training of all of students. But here, when we get the money, I realize that it's like into party. Let's <laughs> do a party. And then you want to just finish everything. But I think that it's something that you need to look at as we are leaving this batch we are going. What can we do for the department? Okay. It may not be that big. Something handy, but at least it will go a long way to really help with the training of the other younger colleagues that will be coming thereafter. All right. Uh, you you said about th something about uh, payment of dues and all of that. In fact, yeah. it has been an, <laughs> an issue and uh, all of that. Maybe because the student, the rest of the students see the student administration as maybe the appointee ones or something. So we want you to give you this opportunity to say something about, about it so that those who have made up their mind not to pay because they feel their monies are being used for something else or something like that. 
they may have a change of mind or something. Unless they have issues with accountability, okay. which I think can be resolved. Otherwise, I want to just advise that it is going to be part of your professional life. Payment of dues as a professional is going to be something annual or a ritual. Yeah. You are going to do every now and then. If you don't cultivate that attitude right now, when you get up there, you have to do it. To become another new science to you, you have to do your annual subscriptions. Every year, once you are given a license, that license has to be renewed mm -hmm. every year and it comes to payment of money. Mm -hmm. And before even that even comes, it's preceded with multiple CPDs. You go for this CPD and you pay. You go for this CPD, you pay. So if you don't learn how to pay money or how to part with money to keep your professional integrity, if you don't learn it now, when are you going to learn it? In fact, I even try to advise the younger women that if you have the males around you who are having difficulty paying for dues and the like, those men, you have to watch out for them because you have to watch, watch, watch out because for such kind of men, it's likely they may have even difficulty paying top money. So you need to be very careful of those people who can just come and pay 50 cities for a whole academic year and that one is another wahala. No, you want that situation to move. You want to be seen as one of the formidable group on campus. You want activities to be done so that the people will feel the presence of our situation. I don't think we do things like that. So as right for the payment of money, I'm telling you, it is part of life. You need to learn how to pay the small ones now. Some of you are thinking that, oh, my money is too small. That's no. what I'm paying. When I get big, I'll pay. Yeah. Once you are not paying no. small, no. when you get big, you won't pay. Okay. <laughs> but that was a quote that I write <laughs> in, that, in that response. I like I liked it. And uh, anyway, the dues is not even up to 50 cities. It's just 20 cities for the whole academic year. Uh, no, sorry. 20 cities for the semester. So 40 cities for the whole academic year. I, mean, so I think I've even inflated the price. Yes. <laughs> anyway. All right. Uh, sir, it is sad to say that it is becoming a norm for the students of our department not to show up in their numbers for departmental activities. What do you have to tell us to ensure maximum participation in the week celebration? Um, I think that is not a good sign of unity and sense of purpose. You know, as professionals, we have a common cause. I've always said to people that apart from our families, the next biggest family we have is our professional fraternity. Yeah. So once, how do we build family? By fellowshipping, coming together, doing things together, and pursuing a common objective. So my thinking is that if we want to achieve this, we have to come together. I've always said one thing that uh, the reason why we need to make sure that we establish the links and all the contacts here is that it's the profession we are going to, that is going to feed us even though God will be feeding us, you feed us through the kind of things we are doing. Yeah. So that is what is going to feed us for the next 30 years, some of you 40 years of your life, 35 years, 25 years, some of you 2 years of your life, <laughs> depending on how old oh, you are. are Good. So whichever thing, whichever the, your case may be, uh, we need to make sure that we have that sense of purpose. Because we meet here and hereafter. We'll be attending congresses, conferences, and all that thing together, both local and international. Okay? Those, some of them are mandatory, and those that are also optional. So we need to make sure that we develop that kind of attitude. And it's just to show and register our commitment. It's why I've talked about people who are disinterested in their own profession. If they are disinterested, sometimes they have no motivation yeah. to even come for this. But those people who are motivated, if you tell them to come at even midnight, they may come. Yeah. Okay? So we need to work on our uh, behavior pertaining to some of these things so that at the end of the day we are sure that we get the right things done at the right time. Okay. Thank you very much for, for that advice. Uh, according to the program outline for the week celebration, we, there's going to be an official symposium tomorrow coupled with a, a career guidance seminar and also a lecture on TV writing. Please share a brief word with us to raise anticipation for, for, for tomorrow's program. Yeah. Um, I want to encourage all imaging students to partake in this particular symposium. As it, as it is going to uh, open our eyes on what are the prospects. Um, there are several other people who live here and say that I'm living here to go and start a new program altogether all because he did not know the opportunities that are available to him or her. And I think that this is going to be an eye-opener. And probably you get people presenting 
as living testimonies, if I'm to use that word. Because it's not like they are saying things they have not experienced. Yeah. They are saying things that they have been part of and they have lived. And then it will serve as a motivation for you. And I believe that from here, the next other thing that most of you will be doing, for now, your current job you are doing is steady. But I am telling you that in the next two or in the next few months to come, especially those who are in final year, your job will be looking for job. <laughs> where you make you yeah. print a lot of applications yeah. and you move yeah. to this place to go and put it's a job we are doing yeah. but that job is looking for job <laughs> and in looking for that job what is going to speak for you because they, where you go you won't leave your picture on the table of the MD or whoever is the uh, uh, proprietor or whatever of that particular company yeah. to say that this man face look at me I'm a fine man <laughs> look at me I'm a very fine woman so won't you <laughs> employ me <laughs> It's the CV which is going to give you a, a give the person a picture of who you are. For the person to say, yes, I'm seeing the right person I want for this job. So that I think that if they come, they are able to know how to write a very good CV. Maybe they will get a tip or a tidbit for how to write a good CV, which is going to serve them. Some of you who even intend to even go for further studies. Sometimes it's just your CV that even push off your perspective, <laughs> your perspective supervisor. They say that, what is this thing? What is this one going to do in this particular place? Because you have, you have, you have left some gap or yeah. you have painted yourself in a particular manner. That doesn't really fit what mm -hmm. purpose you intend to achieve. So I think that it's just an eye-opener um, for you to have such a thing. Those of you who are even in your final year writing your proposal, your project, yeah. for your article clearance, yeah. you needed to submit an abridged CV. And I know some people just wrote their name <laughs> and their house number. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. The, the theme for the week celebration is medical imaging as a prospect. Yesterday, today, and the future. Which happens to be the focus theme for the career guidance seminar. Please say, what do you make of the theme? I think the theme is appropriate. It's a time for reflection. We need to look at what it is today, where we are, or what it was yesterday, where we are today, and what we will be tomorrow. It is very important. For yesterday, you were a student. Today, you were a final year student or you were a graduate. The next few years to come, what do you intend to be? So it is a very good point for us to reflect using that, that, that the tripod before, the now, and then the tomorrow. All right. And then uh, let me just pass this comment. Uh, as circulated by the jingle for the uh, for the re-celebration, can you note that there are going to be resource persons for all these um, topics that we're speaking about, lecture and theory writing, uh, the um, career guidance seminar with respect to the prospects in academia, entrepreneurship, uh, pathway and all of that. So please, um, if you have not watched that video, look for that video and watch it to raise your anticipation so that you have something in mind you want to look up to before you get to them. Uh, Doc, finally, finally, uh, many people are looking up to you, including myself. I must be honest. Kindly give us a word of advice as your final words. Okay. Um, my advice to you is to remain focused don't keep your eye off the ball. Make sure you keep the main thing, the main thing. My reason for saying that I keep the main thing, the main thing is that, you know, when we come to school, the likelihood for us to get distracted is high. You come into this universal city and there are so many things that are begging for your attention. If you're not careful, some of them will sway you. Some of them will take the leadership role that they, 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 they will pick up from this university as their core business at the expense of their world, academic right. life. And I'm thinking that in all the things that we keep on doing in this university, they are supposed to enhance our world, our lifestyle. But we have to keep our eyes on the ball. And the ball is to make sure that we live here with a good degree. So that if even we are thinking today that we need it for anything, let tomorrow tell whether we need it for something or not. So let's make sure that we keep our eyes on the main business and make sure that we show the right attitude towards the reason why we are what we are here. All other things remaining constant. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Samuchi.
So I've been speaking with Dr. Simbucho for the past uh, more than an hour, and then he shared his thoughts with us. We are both grateful to him. Viewers, we've come to the end of the interview. We really appreciate your time spent with us. The interview was brought to you by the Association of Medical Imaging Students. Um, before I say goodbye, let me appreciate the organizers and those who are present with us right now. So uh, we appreciate the Secretariat of the Association of Medical Imaging Students. We also appreciate the President who is currently with us, Mr. Akwa Isaac. We appreciate Miriam Cowen Kwache, who is a crew member. We also appreciate Irene Quay, who is also a crew member. We appreciate Matthias Dake, who is a crew member under the moment, our cameraman. Yes, uh, we say a very big thank you to you all. We also appreciate Abdul Malik Mohammed, uh, acting more or less like a deputy cameraman. We appreciate your help. And then finally, we, we are so much grateful to our host, uh, sorry, our guest, Dr. Samuchi. My name once again is Daniel Jima. Kindly note that the association has social media handles as follows. We have a, a YouTube channel which is Amis UCC Online. So we are A-M-I-S, Amis hyphen UCC Online. For Instagram, we have Amis UCC without any without a hyphen. So we have A-M-I-S UCC Combined. For Twitter, we have Amis UCC Chapter. Amis UCC Chapter. So Amis hyphen UCC. Chapter. And then Facebook, we are also uh, in this VCC, same as the Instagram channel. Please follow us and most especially subscribe to our YouTube channel. There are more interesting content there for you. Until we meet again, have a simple day.